Good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, I'm coming from a, a different location. Um, they recommend now that all clergy and lay people posting services uh, do so from home. Let us look to God and let us pray. O Jesus, source of new life, without whose gift of the Spirit we live dry, dull, and empty lives, without whose gift of living water we know not from which wells to drink, without whose gift of the Spirit we search for meaning in all the wrong places, without whose gift of living water we have more than we need and less than we want, Grant us that gift, so that we never thirst again. Amen. Today is the last in our series of midweek Lenten services. Uh, we have focused upon uh, some of the last words of Jesus from the cross, and today we focus upon Jesus' words, I thirst. Our lessons are both taken from the Gospel of John. First from the fourth chapter. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city named Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty, or have to keep coming here to draw water. And reading further in John's Gospel, in the 19th chapter, After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After the city of Jerusalem fell to the Roman army in 70 AD, large numbers of people were crucified beside the roads leading into the city. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells of finding three of his friends hanging on roadside crosses. He took them down and they were still alive. And two of them, uh, well, for two of them, rescue came too late. And despite the most in intensive care, they died. One man survived the ordeal and was forever grateful to his rescuer. When people died on crosses, it was from exposure and shock caused by loss of blood, from attack of insects, from the sadism of passers-by, from suffocation and from hunger and thirst. The friends of Josephus died presumably because it was too late for them to take food and drink. And of these two human necessities, we're told that thirst is the climax of the anguish suffered 
by a person on the cross. The agony of thirst, by comparison with the pangs of hunger, said one, is like the contrast between noonday and midnight. Now, according to Matthew, Mark, and John, there came a point during the crucifixion when someone responded to the thirst of Jesus. But only in John does Jesus actually speak to those around him of his thirst. And this fifth word, the only one in which Jesus speaks of his pain, seems to us self-explanatory. We need no complicated explanation to impress upon us the significance of unbearable thirst. Although it is not in this country a common experience, it is at least one with which we may sympathize. At the same time, we know neither the heat nor the lack of water to make the experience a real one. At the scene of the crucifixion there stood a container of cheap wine. This type of wine was said to be refreshing and wholesome and was uh, a special favorite with the Roman soldiers. Leon Morris, in his commentary on John's Gospel, uh, stated that it was thought by some that the wine was there particularly for the benefit of the three men on the crosses and not merely for the convenience of the soldiers. Whatever the case, we know from Jewish literature that noble women in Jerusalem made it a project to supply and deliver drugged wine for the relief of persons during their executions. In Morris, we also find this reference. When one is led out to execution, he is given a goblet of wine containing a grain of frankincense in order to numb his senses. For it is written, Give strong drink to him that is ready to perish, and wine unto the bitter of soul. This was a thoughtful, kindly provision, but earlier in the day Jesus had declined it. But at this point he accepted some common wine from a sponge on the end of a reed on a pole. The immediate relief which it brought him is evident in the continuing account. If we saw no more here than that, that were enough in itself. However, we realize that John gives us historical information, both for its own sake, in this case the thirst of the human Jesus, and as a means of interpreting the meaning of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In this instance, there are at least two other things that John would say about Jesus. One of them has to do with the fulfillment of Scripture, the Scripture of John and Jesus, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. Throughout his ministry, but particularly during the last weeks of Jesus' life, John understood Jesus to be God's fulfillment of the predictions of the Hebrew Bible. At this stage in the crucifixion, it seemed to him that one alone of these prophecies remained to be fulfilled. And here John is thinking of Psalm 69 at verse 21, where the psalmist wrote, For my thirst they gave me sour wine. Whatever is taking place during the last days and hours in the life of Jesus is taking place in harmony with the plan of God. That is how John understands what is happening. And more, nothing that happens on Good Friday is happening beyond the control of God. Now John would go further and have us realize that everything that happens on Good Friday is within the plan of God for the sake of humankind. Yes, said John, Jesus said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. On another occasion, long before Good Friday, one that uh, I had read earlier from the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, and one that uh, appeared, I believe, in the lectionary readings uh, 
earlier uh, in uh, March, Jesus sat down by Jacob's well, probably one of the most famous watering holes in the Hebrew literature. He was thirsty on that occasion, and of all people, he asked a Samaritan woman for a drink of water. During the dialogue that followed his request, Jesus and the woman spoke of two kinds of water, one that will quench your thirst for a little while, and one that will quench your longing for true life so completely that you will never ever be thirsty again. Sheldon Mackenzie, in uh, his uh, little book uh, designed for a three-hour Good Friday service entitled The Words He Spoke, has written, Isn't it ironic that Jesus, the one who offers to us the water of life that stills all thirst, here cries out for something to drink? And... Barnabas Linders, in his commentary on John's Gospel, also writes, Isn't it ironic that before Jesus is able to give us the water of life, he must himself suffer thirst? If anyone thirsts, said Jesus, let him come to me and drink. And this he said, according to John, about the gift of the Spirit, to be given to those who believed in him after he had been glorified. Jesus said, I thirst. Yes, Lord, and so do we. Amen. Let us pray. O Jesus, blessed Redeemer, with whom our meditations began, in a prayer for the forgiveness of others, we give thanks that we felt its power to transform and renew. Our devotions end now in another prayer, in which, with you, we commend ourselves to God. We give thanks that we feel its safety and assurance, and help us so to live our lives in the trust and fellowship of God, that at the end we turn naturally to the one with whom we have ever been secure. Amen. Go in love and peace to serve the Lord with joy and with gladness. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.